Oh, it's rolling. Oh, no. You don't need to do that. <laughs> Just uh, in case we do. Hot. It's getting hot in here. Take up on you, and I am getting to her. I'm going to take my call. Oh, I just realized the mistake I've made. Of course. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Planet FPL, the world where everything roars around Fantasy Premier League. My name's Such. And my name is James. Uh, nine games down. Football's back. Yes, football's back. Thank goodness. Proper football. None of this on tour friendly stuff. Proper football is back, and yeah. I've got my first hangover of the season. Good morning, nice. everyone. Fair play. It had to be done, didn't it? The team played yesterday. Uh, well, it didn't have to be done. We have an in jo- um, we have an in joke in in our family that my dad is immortal. Like he'll, he'll immortal. Like, yeah, he'll like he'll he'll outlive all of us. I told him at half time yesterday. I said, "You ain't making it to the end of this season, mate. Forget that. They, they're going to put you through too much pain here, mate." Uh, yeah, probably, <laughs> possibly. Um, fingers crossed that Mister Linden doesn't. Uh, Hi, Dad. No, no, no. We don't want him to. No. I don't live forever. Please, please so. don't. Please don't cut that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, seemed like a pretty uh, funny old weekend of fantasy. I went to fest on Friday. So Good fun. the first, first and foremost, before um, we get into the actual football, we've got to deal with the whole deadline situation first, right? That's because that's a that's a bit of a. Um, Drama in itself before the football's even started with team leaks. Now I think it's like it's becoming so much part and parcel of FPL. It was a it was so bizarre. Um, I went to Fest. They were giving out a free drinks voucher for when you arrive. I'm not really uh, a drinker, but if it's a free drinks voucher, I'm going to have the best value drink I can, which is a can of Red Stripe. Happened to be so having a can of Red Stripe blissfully happy and then someone was walking around saying some nonsense about the Man City team it wasn't nonsense it was whatever Stones isn't playing and someone else isn't playing someone else isn't playing or whatever and genuinely at that point it must have been 10 to 6 I'd say Uh, maybe just gone 6 I was so not bothered I was like he's first sub in my team anyway I can option one is I sit here with my can of red stripe and just enjoy my life or figure out a way of... Because the phone reception was a bit bad. I'd have to go outside and change my team and whatever else. And I decided I was going to do nothing because I just didn't care enough than Stones. To be honest, the thing is, when you get these team leaks, and the same for Gabrielle, we don't know why, right? We didn't know if it was an injury with Stones. We didn't know if it's an injury with Gabrielle he's just dropped. I'm like, if he's just dropped, then there's every chance next week it'll be reversed. So why bother stressing myself and making a transfer? So I thought I'd leave it. And then um, uh, Dread FPL, do you know Jules, Julian? Yeah, top yeah. man, top man. So he started talking to me about Sky because he has never played Sky before. It's his first season, so he wanted to talk to me about Sky. I was like, cool, yeah, I don't mind talking a bit about Sky, especially because he hadn't played before. He had a few players in his team that I was like, where did that come from? Like Esri Concer, for example, I'm like... I'm I'm not sure. That's just it's <laughs> like the most left field pick I've seen in a team, mate. Um, so then I thought, fine. Do you know what? Actually, sod it. I'll get rid of Stones and I get Chilwell. I was going to get Chilwell on my team anyway. So I thought, fine. I'll sell Stones, buy Chilwell. Done. Then Gabriel news apparently dropped an Andy stream, right? That yeah. he wasn't going to play. I was like, well, that's a pain in the ass. And it's a fifty fifty with Saliba or forty one forty nine. Anyway, let me. And now we're close. Five minutes out, three minutes out from deadline, and everybody at Fest was obviously dealing with the it proper trend. panic. There it wasn't panic, but everybody was making changes for sure. Like if they owned Stones or Gabriel with the two, so I sold Gabriel, got Saliba, but everyone's in that so Unfortunately, whatever the message is on the FPL site, right? So um, I managed to sell Gabriel and bought Saliba. Cool. Then. It wasn't until the following, it wasn't that night that I got home that I realised a couple of things. One, that I tinkered with my Sky team and bought Rodri. Good lad. I didn't even realise, like, Rod, if people regularly listen to Sky, well, no, just, I love Just to clarify, you had one red stripe, yeah? Uh, I'd had two by then, for sure. <laughs> and I had another one in my hand. Um, but I couldn't remember buying Rodri, honestly, in Sky. And then... It wasn't until, t- uh, sorry, it let wasn't me tell you from the WhatsApp messages I was getting Friday night, you were definitely pissed. 
Yeah, that's a couple, but it doesn't take a lot for me. You got to also understand it doesn't take a lot, right? Your five points is my two points, no doubt. So I got got Rodri, I got Saliba, and then it was yesterday that I realised this. Now we're on to Sunday. I didn't actually get Chilwell. I've still got Stones first sub. So the original <laughs> transfer that I thought I made, I hadn't actually made. So Stones is still sitting in there for me as first sub, even though I thought I'd bought Chilwell. But I did dodge Gabrielle's benching and got a salute. So you wouldn't have had Chilwell's points anyway? Is, nah, is because that... he would have been first sub. Right, okay. Um, but it would, like Chilwell's the transfer I want to make this week, so yeah, okay. it would have saved me a transfer. But then everybody else in my team um, hasn't done too badly. Um, I'm sitting on 69 points right now, which is just Stop inside the laughing. top million. No laughing at the back, but I've got Onana and Rashford to go. So I'm hoping if a six, seven pointer out of Onana will get me to mid 70s. What's and the rank on that for the game week at the moment? 970k. Yeah, cool. It's not bad. Yeah, it's fine. Um, yeah, I'm, and I lined up obviously Onana in goal. Uh, Estupinian's seven pointer. Should have been 27-pointer. Uh, Trent and Saliba. Trent, we do need to talk about. Foden, Martinelli, Saka, Mitoma. Obviously, all returned bar Foden. And then Pedro and Holland captain. Um, Turner, Kabore, Mbama, Stones on the bench. So Rashford still to go, but everybody owns him. And Onana could be could get me a little bit of a, a rise. But I'd, I'd happily take like 75, 77 right now. Because um, a lot of people did well. Rashford with Onana tonight, yeah? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's four for appearance. Give me a clean sheet. That's another eight. So I'll be up to like, yeah, mid late, mid, late 70s, maybe 80 if I, if it goes well. And uh, I'll take that all day long, to be honest with you. Plus, uh, it's not just about what the score is this week. Because we talk about this in Sky a lot. You've got to give it a few weeks while the dust settles. Um, we really can't be looking at ranks or point differential point differences too much. Give it a couple of weeks. I'm going to look at mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, when you're doing well, enjoy it. But I think everybody is doing well. Um, yeah, yeah. T- the template has started well. Very well. Yeah. So, uh, and it's up or down five or ten points here or there, which is what we thought it might be because it's up or down one or two different players. Um, so, yeah, I'm doing okay. 69 It's very steady. Uh, the only issue is obviously the John Stones issue, but we don't know. It's hamstring, right, with John Stones? Uh, tight hamstring was, was the word, wasn't it, that, that Guardiola uh, gave. He played a, a pass to someone and he felt tight, so they wasn't going to take a risk with him. And to be honest, he is so important and integral to what they want to do going forward. Um, that it doesn't surprise me they didn't take the but risk. They've got, the, they've got the Super Cup game Wednesday. They've got Newcastle Saturday. Take your time with it. I mean, yeah. City could end up playing with a completely different back four in theory against Newcastle this weekend. Um, so I'd like to rewind to my Friday. Yeah, because I've I was, I'm going to ask you. I've got I've only got one regret from my 15, and it's a half regret. And I'm going to ask you what your regrets are. But let's do your team first, then we'll get into... No, do we on. have any regrets? Go on, do your uh, regrets. Do, do your team first. I want to see what you got. No, so obviously we did the final the draft boost. Friday. Yeah. And I said, yeah, look, I'm bench boosting. But I also said there's six players who, if there was a, a, an inkling of a doubt about them, I was going to abort and not do it. And one of those six players was Dominic Solanke. Sure enough, one o'clock, me and Nico have gone for something to eat, have a bit of lunch, and it breaks. Dominic Solanke... Major doubt for Bournemouth. And of course, he played and There's scored. No doubt in Sodden the fucking eighties, whatever minute. It was. <laughs> <laughs> but those new round here, such supports West Ham. I support Tottenham. Um, so, so I'm sitting there with Nico. I'm going, Nico, I still want to play this chip. Like he's doubled down because I didn't. To be honest, the right thing to do probably would have been a abort. But I'm, I'm going. No, I want to. I want to do it because I was really happy with the rest of it. So the first thing I ended up doing was I put odds on Edouard in the team. Who scored? So See, <laughs> I just want to say one thing, right? In that Friday, you'd mentioned so many names. I know. That by the time we'd gotten to the end of the day, I don't know who was in your bench boost. And then as certain players like Edouard was scoring, I was like, I know James mentioned his name yesterday and other players that keep popping up, Solanke. I know he mentioned his name yesterday. I have no idea who he's finally pr- actually pr- putting his... Pretty boost. much every alternative I mentioned to you did quite well. Yeah. Um, Sod's Law I mean Edward actually had Edward actually today, had yeah. the highest non-penalty XG yeah. um, over the weekend believe it or not but I'm looking wasn't Eze's pretty high as well uh, Eze massive in terms won, of chance it? created and shot. I think it's seven chances created and about eight shots as well um, but his XG wasn't particularly high um, 
So I'm sitting there. I'm now looking at this bench booth and I've got three Crystal Palace on it, right? Sam Johnson, odds on Edward and Ebe Eze. And as much as I really, really thought Palace were going to go there and win comfortably, which which they did really by the, the one nil scoreline, they should have won by more. I'm looking, I'm going, I'm a really bench boosting with three Crystal Palace players playing away from home. I'm like, mm. oh my God, what am I doing? So the original one that I looked at earlier in the week, when, when I kind of made my final decision on Tuesday, because the t- team hadn't changed from Tuesday evening to Friday afternoon at all. And the final decision I decided on Tuesday night was obviously to go Eze and Solanke over Watkins and Garnacho. And the more I was going round and round in circles, I'm like, just go back to Watkins and Garnacho. Watkins was going to save me the transfer further on because he was probably going to be a player that I wanted for this particular week. The structure was a little bit better in terms of having a clear kind of eighth choice attacking player, i.e. Garnacho, as a cheaper player. Okay, not 4.5, but 5.0. And more thinking about it, like uh, real concerns over him. Oh, was he going to be a one point? Or was he going to be a one point? And just kind of actually, you know what? What if he does great and he's an amazing differential for me? And uh, tonight will tell one way or the other. So I ended up with a Watkins gone at and was like, right, settled. No problem at all. I start the deadline stream because some of us were working rather than being at Fret Fest Friday night, Serge. Yep. And literally, as I'm about to stream, I'm getting messages left, right, and center. John Stones ain't starting. <laughs> oh, no. So what are we going to do now? So I considered loads of alternatives. What I think I did quite sensibly was quite early in the sort of the, the build up to the hour, it was like sussing out information. And there was a lot going around as well that uh, Gvardio wasn't starting either because that was the first fault. That was the backup plan, right? John Stones isn't starting, go and get Gvardio. Fine, put a 0.5 in the bank. So, and we knew also obviously in the room Diaz wasn't going to be fit because of concussion protocols. So you start narrowing it down, you're like, well, it's almost clear who he's going to play. It's got to be Walker, Aki, Akanji and, and Lewis. Yeah. The only question mark is Laporte. And if Stones isn't playing, I completely understand why there's rumours going around that Lewis is going to play because he's the one that naturally comes in and voted. So what I did quite early was I just put Lewis in the team. Mm-hmm. But Lewis in the team, I left it with a one million in the bank. And I considered, while I was answering the questions in Australia, I was considering loads of options, absolutely loads. But everyone that was interested in me, so say, like, I'll go, all right, I'll go Tarkovsky or I'll go Gay or Anderson, it was like I already had Pickford and Johnston sitting there and I didn't want double Everton defence or, or come back to double Palace defence. I didn't want that. So I wanted to pick something that was from something that I didn't have coverage of to give me a wide spread. And I just kept going back in loops and I was like, just leave Lewis there. Just leave him. Leave the money in the bank. That's what I decided to do. And then about five, four minutes before deadline, the word was coming through that Andy had said on this stream. Well, obviously, I wasn't listening to what Andy said, but you're obviously getting Chinese messages. The word at that point was, all I got was, he's taken Gabriel, Gabriel out and he's put Saliba in his team. And so I didn't know the information of what had got relayed to Andy or not because I was doing my own stream. Um, so I just I just knew and I remembered when Andy come on the pod with us uh, uh, with me a couple of months ago when you was away I think around about April time I just I, I just knew in my head one of the best reliable sources he had he said was was from Arsenal and I thought why is he doing that lastminute.com and exactly like you it's like okay yeah Gabriel is clear of Saliba on XG but this is close enough just transfer it just change it yeah. didn't really think twice about it I literally just did it um, and so obviously ended up with with Saliba in the team. And to be fair to Andy, Andy has essentially saved, I wouldn't say saved the bench boost because Gabriel obviously came on. But had Gabriel not come on, he's basically saved the bench boost to me. So Andy, I want to say thank you very much. But and the bench boost is the bench boost anyway. No, but it's a psychological, isn't it? That I basically would have been down to 14 players. You want 15 but starts. You would have got a minute, uh, a point. No, but I'm saying if you didn't come on at all, I've lost a player. Yeah, I, yeah. If I'd have yeah, stayed yeah, with Gabriel, I'd have yeah, been yeah, delighted yeah. to obviously have his one point. I'd yeah. be like, yep, thank you very much for the one point. I mean, yeah. It comes down to this week, at the moment as it stands, say Anana keeps a clean sheet today, taking the bench boost out of it, um, the difference between us will be one clean sheet. So either a Rico Lewis or, a, or Chilwell um, as a clean sheet because all the other players are the same. So I'm on 91. I went with Pickford and Johnston as the keepers, as I said. Um, and Johnston kind of clear second choice to that. I wanted, obviously, if I was going to go keepers in single game, I really wanted to go for someone that's the second choice who I was really confident was going to get the clean sheet. That returned. Uh, obviously, Lewis and Saliba ended up in. It's Stupinan, Chilwell. I've got Shaw to go tonight. Saka, Rashford, Mitoma, Martinelli and Garnacho. 
Orland captain, Jao Pedro, Ollie Watkins. So, Jordan Pickford, you've ruined my weekend because well, every other player has returned. So. Listen, you can't get greedy. Um, and why not? We can't get greedy because this game will come back and uh, you'll end up with 22 points next week with zero returns oh. just as quickly as we'll end up with yeah. a full house. Ne- so. nearly, nearly every player away from home. So, that 91 with obviously the three United to go tonight is it's a good start. As exactly what I said on Friday, like I'm not jumping hoops or anything. I said, we won't know if this bench boost is successful or not till the end of the season. So, you know, if, if, I, if I finish now, what I've got, 11 from Johnston Watkins, could arguably say 12 because I would have played Watkins over Lewis particularly with not being certain if Lewis was going to play um, even if Garnacho Shaw do nothing then in theory I'm sort of 15-16 and that would be I always said it at 16 then I for the double game weeks eight players playing twice do absolutely nothing eight times two equals 16 that's always kind of a target for me but if I end up just short of that that's absolutely fine but I could say right I've finished with 16 as an example Maybe the bench boost on that plan towards the end of the season would be that it's a it's a monster and I've had 25 or 30 on the bench. So what I'll do towards the end of the season is, um, for myself, is I'll, I'll kind of track a, what I would have wildcarded. Whenever I use that second wildcard, track it what I would do differently if I was setting it up for a bench boost and, and see at the end of the season. So it's gone okay. It's a good start. I'm 5.5k for the game week, which, listen, I should be kind of probably minimum top 100k having yeah, yeah, having bench chip. boost. Yeah, absolutely. So that might even end up even better by the end of tonight. It's a good start. I don't normally have them, so let's yeah, see where I, we go. I don't know. Bruno goes big, that could be the opposite. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think Bruno's the one that's maybe a bit scary out there. And Anana for you as well. Like, but if he gets I, a penalty save... Yeah, yeah, sure. That could be... But then big, but Shaw could get me an attacking return yeah, versus exactly, the Onanas, yeah, so, right? So, yeah. and... Garnacho is obviously the wild card for me tonight. Indeed. Um, the only one I... This is... A lot of people are going to have uh, regrets over any tr- uh, players that they started with. The one that I'm worried about is Trent, if I'm honest with you. And it's not even... Look, it's Chelsea's, Chelsea away is a tough game to start with. No one's bought Trent for one week. You buy him, you know it's over a long period he'll be consistent as hell. My issue was... Following the numbers because of Sky, we're looking at past numbers and, and that kind of thing. Like, he had no passes at all. He was not orchestrating play or dictating. He won't play, play Chelsea midfield. every week, mate. Yeah, so this is it, right? It's like, okay, it's a worryingly low number of passes, like in the 30s and 40s. Like, I think he had four after about 20 minutes. I'm like, uh, is he not touching the ball at all? Chelsea played well yesterday, don't get me wrong. So it's not like it was a, an easy game and no one's subbing this guy out before Bournemouth at home. But I don't know enough about the tactical impact of that positional change to see, will it be a positive? Because yesterday it wasn't. But that's as much to do with the opposition as well. So let's see what happens against Bournemouth at home. Oh, you've got to suck it up this week. Oh, if you 100%. Him, you've got to keep it. Um, but the, the, sure, the surely numbers, underlying numbers yesterday didn't fill this, me with this, confidence. This, this, I get that. This comes, back, this comes back. Through, from through balls that Salah could have got on the end so of. So what we discussed last Monday and said, considering about like outcome bias, right? Yeah. And whams if Mo Salah gets hat trick and you haven't got him, and what do you want to do? Well, the reverse of that is something like this. Trent's gone to Chelsea and got a one point. Yeah, but it's Chelsea away. Like, surely the expectations weren't for him to go through the roof in in game week one and we have no, to say that's fractionally, why I'm not looking at the outcome I'm fra- looking at the underlying fractionally numbers. he obviously set Salah up for the disallowed goal True. and you potentially those sitting there with Trent and Salah find margins and have had a very different game week maybe so now if you've got Trent like you, you can't be selling before this no 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 I'm not saying that it's more and it's not even the fact that he didn't return it's more the underlying numbers the involvement but it's Chelsea away yeah, exactly that's the other caveat that's the other caveat. So it's not, it's not, I, I, I'm by no means saying that it's a regret. It's more a, hmm, that might be one that I need to fix. Listen, it's going to be one probably, if he does blank at the weekend, say Liverpool win 2-1 and, and he blanks, um, then there's going to be more of a decision to begin to think about when he's then going to Newcastle the next week and got Villa at home the week after, right? Then that probably is going to, and you start looking down and going, oh yeah, that Chilwell's doing well, Estupanan's doing well, whatever you have or you don't have, right? There's there's cheaper alternatives there. As to why I didn't go with, wasn't wasn't that I thought Trent would be bad, right? Of course not, right? 
it's just it was just too big a difference versus too many good players at the five five point five bracket was was my opinion. Yeah, the flip side is he pulls out a fifteen point exactly. next week and everyone's going to exactly. be sw- swarming to him. So that's why the early weeks are really um, kind of keep your powder dry. Are you planning at the moment as it stands to need to make any transfers or not so much? Uh, don't need to. I mean the way I, the way I set it up, like the, the team looks absolutely fine this week in the sense that you know I can put Watkins back in the eleven instead of. Of Lewis and it, you know, it still looks strong enough. I've, as I said, I've got a lot of players away. So the free Brighton away to Wolves, the Stupinam, Mitoma, Joel Pedro, free Arsenal away to, to Palace. I've got Chilwell away to West Ham. Um, obviously, Holland is at home to Newcastle. Both goalkeepers don't look great. The intention is still to keep Pickford out of the two. Watkins at home to Everton is is obviously fine and and reasonable, but they're okay. I want Rashford obviously at Tottenham. They're they're not terrible. I mean, particularly like for Rashford could have a field day yeah, at Tottenham I feel with, like, with the um, running in behind, right? I feel like my two United and Anna and Rashford I play against Tottenham away. Like like you, I've got the the Brighton boys away at Wolves, but we'll know more about Wolves today. But I think that Brighton still went and scored f- five in the the weekend. Is it four? Yeah, look, bench, um, bench is going to look strong. And listen, with what I've done, that's going. You know, I'm potentially not not this week. I don't think like benching Shaw and Garnacho at Tottenham. I think's fine. I'm going to have more of a headache with it the following week. Um, there's no real need to make a transfer this week. If I go in with that, it's fine. However, obviously, I've I've now got one million in the bank because of that Rico Lewis move, um, and I'm actually looking to make it more. So the transfer I'm thinking about most this week is Johnston to Turner. Yeah. Now, uh, now I've got clarity that he's obviously gone straight in goal and stuff, and he's at home with Sheffield United this week. I'm I think um, Stones moving Stones on to Chilwell, but Stones is sitting first sub for me this week, and he's going to stay first sub for me. So why not just kick that can forward? Um, if I'm if I'm going to buy Chilwell, who am I going to bench out of Foden and Holland? I'm a home game, not going to uh, Wolves for for Brighton. I still think is solid. Arsenal boys away at Palace is solid. Tottenham away for. Uh, um, United is fine and Bournemouth at home yeah, so definitely yeah. do not be benching your Rashfords nah. this week like, no way let's talk about some of these games and rattle through them and Go see if there's it. any interesting because there are other players that we may not have spoken about that um, raised their hand let's say and uh, like you said going to Turner we have another 4.0 playing goalkeeper that I would hold my hands up and say I didn't see come in at all in Areola, uh, yes, example. such is so. actually apologising, Chris Stone. Well done, mate. Yeah, Chris was right. <laughs> Chris was right, but um, it, it came out of there was no evidence to say that Areola would start, but can, he did. But can the we fact also that say Areola's in, Chris was no way sure. <laughs> if Areola's in, but the fact that he started, Areola's, I would say now Areola's in because he played well. He had an alright game, to be fair. So uh, it, it's 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 an interesting one with with Areola. He's in, mate. I'm, I don't know. I'm not certain. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go right. Ariola's definitely new. West Ham's new number one. But I think there might be a bit of flip flop in that. Like Deserby basically said, uh, Steel and Verbrug are going to play fifty fifty, didn't they? Yeah. He's like, Steel's going to play tomorrow, and after that, they're going to be fifty fifty. So Moyes said after the game, he's like, look, I've got two number ones. Now maybe it's going to flip where Fabianski's going to play all the cup games this year, and Ariola's going to play the league games. I'm sure it was probably getting to the point. This was Chris's reasoning. It's probably getting to the point where Ariola's going. I, how much longer I'm going to sit here and be number two? Yeah. And with due respect, he's not number two at a team that's challenging for the league or something no. like that. It's like, I should be a number one goalkeeper now. So it could be. Those who've gone would be delighted because he would have lose. You could see Ariola to Turner. Loads would have just gone for that, especially with Forest fixture this week, if Ariola hadn't played. Now we should probably start with Ariola and, and Turner and just sucked up that I'd have had a little less. Obviously, that's a combination you, you can obviously look at now. Well, get that wild card out, James. Uh, Burnley nil, Manchester City three. No chance. Um, difficult these this for uh, when, when when you're playing Man City and then they're up within five minutes, the whole state of the game is going to change, right? Because everything you hope for, which keep it tight, hang on, try and nick them on the counter, just is gone straight away, and it's like one touch, one goal, Holland scores, and then the whole. The whole dynamic, like you're like, what can we learn about Burnley and stuff like that? Well, we're learning about Burnley in a situation where they're chasing a game against Man City, who are just imperious. Hall and second finish, class. Um, so first one wasn't bad, considering yeah, yeah, first, first touch. touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally, you can imagine ev- everybody just went at the same time. First touch, oh, next <laughs> touch is back. Um, the the I suppose there were a few talking points, and we talked about the back line, but we did talk about that with Stones already. Now we know. That um, 
KDB has pulled up mm. again. So the question mark then is like Foden, but then Alvarez is going to get minutes now. If Al- if you said to me, Alvarez is going to get minutes, would you be interested in doubling up? I've got three City now, so I'm not really in a position where I can manoeuvre one way or another. Um, the, the more I watch Alvarez, the more I think really he's he's just he's no better as an option when he plays in in with Holland than some of the other City players. He's he's generally my take. Um, I think there's always going to be a minutes concern about him. He's one if Holland gets injured. For me, it's just light and day. Just go and get the fact him. There's three strikers and, and positions and spread, and spread as well. The mm. And Foden didn't return, but he could have, should have. No, interesting. So he played on the left in the opening 20 when De Bruyne got injured. He shoved him to the, the right. Foden on the left in a, in an, against an opponent like that, who's obviously going to sit off a, a little bit deeper when you get into the final third. I, I like him less off the left, whereas on the right, I think he's freer to go where he wants. And obviously, centrally, he could be absolutely dynamite. So he moves to the right. They shoved Alvarez, really, to, to the left. There was definitely concern. Guardiola had caution in this game. De Bruyne started the game really deep, basically, alongside Rodri. And uh, once they shifted it about Kovacic and Bernardo Silva, obviously, basically took turns to go and play with Rodri as well. He was, as, he was outstanding, Rodri. What a player. Um so I don't know what happens next with with Foden. Does he automatically go? It seems just so obvious to me. Just stick him in the ten position and get on with it. Well, it's KDB. I mean, it could be quite serious. It could be sort of a two three month job. We don't have the prognosis it's one yet. Of them it's so niggly. It's like give him enough time to heal properly. Maybe they're trying to rush him back or or what have you. So you know, if, if you're worried about Foden off that performance on Friday, I wouldn't judge it quite yet, and I certainly wouldn't be looking to move off with what's to come. You know, home fixture, then Sheffield United away, for example. So if you're on Foden, I definitely want to stick there. Also, the flip of that is I'm not thinking, oh my God, I've got to get there. Mm. You know, there's there's more to view here. Um, and there's always, there's always the obsession, I think, with City when we've got good runs of fixtures. Like, I want three. That's how we all feel. But with the bloke up top just hoovering everything, like how, how good are the others? I think Gradiol obviously came on very late. He's one really to watch because I think at that value at five... And he may even dip to 4.9 possibly over the next couple of weeks, especially if, say, City didn't keep a clean sheet at a weekend or if he doesn't start. I think he's he's really interested because that's cheap and he's going to play the majority of the games. And although he came on as a sub Friday night, probably in most occasions he probably wouldn't come on as a sub. So you either get him or your sub comes on. I think he's possibly the one to watch. I still think the upside of John Stones for you, you've still got, is if he's fit to play this weekend, I'd want to keep that. I still think he'll be the, the highest scoring one. He's still on but, my bench. But there's a good case to say that it's so blurry. Like, why bother when you've got your likes of your Chilwells, your Stupinans and stuff do yeah. look like, well, Chilwells fit, touch wood for him, that these guys are going to be more offensive, play regularly. And what do we really want from the City defenders? Is it clean sheets? Is it assuredness that they're going to play? Like, as I said, I think three of that back four could be completely different against Burnley. But you might reward them and go, you played all right. Go again. I've no idea. So, I mean, at the moment, well, look, Lewis Newcastle would sit on the bench for me. Newcastle obviously had a, a good result, so it's not going to be an easy game next week. There'll be a not massive confidence, Newcastle, coming into this season, picking up where they left off. We'll talk about them. But, yeah, but uh, we'll, we'll know more. Burnley lined up a little bit differently than what we might have expected. So, Jack uh, Turfy Topper said on Correspondent where he said that he thought Burnley would, would potentially use a back five in, in sort of games like this. That's basically what they did. They they played with quite an interesting sort of five two two one pressing shape off the ball. And actually, for the first sort of half hour or so, I thought they did pretty well. They went heavy man to man. That's really brave for a promoted team to do that against uh, Manchester. City. I would say what I saw in that opening half hour told me that they they're quite tactically mature. I think their heads probably went a little bit in the sense of it went two 0 one. You know from there the game's gone almost for anybody once you go 2-0 down against Manchester City. And I, I think it, it was obviously taxing and tough on the legs. Didn't help that that challenge from Anas Saruri is was awful. I don't think he meant it, by the way, but it was, it was definitely a red card. We thought he'd play. Amdouni, basically, uh, the new sign is Zeki Amdouni. He played as the nine. I don't know if that will stick. I think Burnley are going to get a new forward in. It's worth saying, obviously, they're blank this week. Then there's a tough game with Villa in, in I think it's Villa three, Tottenham four, isn't it? So you oh, can boy. watch them wait them. Yeah, the the one that obviously people have had is is Bayer who limped off, um, and is four point zero 
one to keep an eye on. I, I, I do think he'll be a regular for them going out throughout the season, but obviously keep an eye on the injury news on him. You might not get it this week. I don't suppose you were going to move it anyway because you knew they didn't have a fixture. And the interesting one, obviously, Trafford got the nod in goal, which I think that one is clearer. It's to say, right, he's come in and he's going to be number one. They have a set-piece problem defensively, and it's something you should be aware of, I think, in future weeks coming up, that they're going to need to fix that. I think by the time they play Villa in game week three, their team might look quite different. Uh, Arsenal 2, Nottingham Forest 1 after the delayed kickoff, which was kind of the Gooners, because they could finish watching uh, the Lionesses. Uh, what, the Gals? Yeah, through to the semis. Uh, Wednesday, isn't it, the semis? Yes, Wednesday it's morning. Australia, mate. And I'm not recording podcast during that one. Just, Australia, just so you know, mate. What time is it? Early morning? It's like 11 ish or something. Oh, okay. It's a reasonable time. And then final long, is when? Long lunch Wednesday. Final Sunday morning. Sunday a.m. Yes. Nice. Cool. Um, but yes, delayed kickoff. Uh, I ended up watching the first half. Um, and it was basically this is a training match. Uh, attack versus defence. You know, we'd both predicted 4-0 to Arsenal. I think when yeah. we did that, what we didn't probably factor in was Nottingham Forest taking the approach of we're just going to sit in here and break us down. Oh, and that's exactly what I thought they'd do. I just didn't <laughs> think they'd be able to stop them. Well, yeah, and I suppose it, it, this is a problem for, for some of these better teams like Arsenal and City and what have you. When, when um, you're just constantly trying to break them down, but they don't give you any space in between. So the fact that Arsenal were able to get... 2 new up by the break, I thought was was a positive because they'd struggled previously where they've got this to break a team down and have the patience to maybe stick with it. I mean, they played well in the first first half of Arsenal. I thought they dominated the ball quite well and, and um, what have you. But then, so I switched it off because I knew I wanted to watch West Ham at three. So I thought, right, I've got some gardening to do. I've got an hour and a half. Let me smash it through it. And then I'm ready to sit down at three o'clock again. And obviously, second half was way more entertaining than the first half because Nottingham Forest actually tried to make a game of it a little bit from what I was listening on the radio. I mean, even Forest Consolation kind of came out of nothing. It came from an Arsenal corner. I mean, blistering pace from Anthony Yeah, Langer. this is it, right? It was, so, it was Saka chasing him. He couldn't, he couldn't get yeah. near him. Um, uh, obviously, Elanga and Winnie, who didn't uh, start the game, teamed up for the goal. And then you've got Brennan Johnson and um, Gibbs White. And uh, who was on the right? Not Yates. Um uh, Danilo kind of played a hybrid role. So you th- uh, it's uh, when he keeps scoring. So he, you'd think he'd want to play up top, which means what? Brendan Johnson drops out, or does he move back to the right? Does that mean Danilo drops out? Oh, Elanga might want to get into the team. We keep hearing that Brendan Johnson might move. Yeah, so. I think yeah, it was it was all right. Arsenal's Arsenal. Any one of them, any time. Yeah, I, I think this is one that like that, uh, Arsenal were comfortable. With. It's interesting because. They had the third lowest XG of, of the 18 teams that's played so far. So not in the Forest actually finished the game with a higher XG, which if you watch the game... There's a few one-on-ones <laughs> maybe. That you couldn't look at the game and go, oh, Forest deserved the draw. Really. No way. No, it was in complete domination control, but they did struggle to create clear-cut chances. Didn't have a single big chance in the game. Saka's obviously scored a weldy, and it's a weldy of an assist for Martinelli for obviously Eddie and Ketcher's goal as well. Um, there, there is a feeling of, I wouldn't say discontent from Arsenal fans, but a little bit of concern that they don't finish off games like this. Like the nervousness yeah. that they experienced in the final five, ten minutes, they should never have been going through that, right? There, there was no no concern or duress, but it was almost like Arsenal were, were quite content to say, 2-0, we're comfortable with, but it takes one moment and then it just takes a, a drop of a ball from a set piece. Like, you know, it lands, I didn't think it was a penalty, but... Yep. You know, a different referee on a different day maybe maybe does give that and all of a sudden you've drawn the game, right? And it mm. should never have been in that position. I think Ars- it's something Arsenal needs to, to work on. But they did get over the line and come uh, May, if they're in, in the title race, I, I also we're think not going to remember it. What they did tactically in the game led to part of sometimes a slower build-up than maybe what you'd expect from Arsenal. So what they were trying to do, we, we've seen a lot of this 3-2-5 build-up last year as Inchenko moving into inverted, but they were moving more parts during this game. So we're basically going into a 3-1-6, or you could say a 3-1-5-1 with Nketiah at the spear. But I think we, we talk about kind of a, a front line of a five in terms of a build-up. Xhaka and Odegaard last year in the pockets, the two wide players, and, and you're, you're, you're forward through the middle. But this was moving differently. So you had Party coming from right back, going into centre midfield. But it wasn't like in the past, say Zinchenko had gone in and joined in. When Party went inside, 
Rice disappeared and went into left eight position and Havertz come off the left eight position and went into a 10 position. And I think the reason for doing that is there's a consciousness when when playing against teams of a back five, you don't have numerical advantage. So the moving the six into that front line creates a numerical advantage and pushes Forest midfield players back even deeper. And then someone's got to take responsibility for something. Then suddenly Arsenal have created an extra man in there by moving three players, which can give the illusion all the time that they're playing with an extra person on the pitch. But whenever Arsenal did do that, where party came inside and then Rice went, it felt very, like in laboured moments of the game, I would say in respect, where the build-up was very slow, Forrest were putting no pressure press on, it almost felt like something of tactical structure as in, we're going to do this now because we can. Like, I'm not sure that's going to work as well in, say, a higher pressure environment, say, like when they play Manchester United in game week four, as an example. But yeah, it's something to keep an eye on where there was moving party, Rice and Havertz, three different roles. But it was it, it just became a slow build-up. And we're never doing it when the game was moving at any tempo. It was always at slow. So if the game was at a higher tempo, Party was supporting Saka down the right-hand side, for example. So, I think yeah, it was Forest, enough. I'm making no judgment until after the Sheffield United game. I feel like you can't judge a team against Arsenal away. Because, nah, for example, I own Gibbs White in um, Sky, for example, and I'm like, look, to be honest, in terms of his effectiveness, because of we know his capability... I'm not judging it on this game. So let's see how they get on next week when they've got uh, Sheffield United at home, which we know their home form was better last year and we can we can have I a would, I would expect, isn't. subject to his fitness, there was some concern amongst the Forest supporters that Awani might have been had a more serious problem than Forest were letting on. So the fact he's come on and scored is a real positive. Alanga's brief cameo, real positive. There's every chance that those two go into the team with Gibbs, White and Johnson on Friday night and we look at a very different night in the throw list, quite possibly. So, look, they've got rough away games, real pressure on these two home games they've got with Sheffield United in game week two and Burnley game week five. And obviously, this one first. That The, the state Sheffield United are in at the moment, they almost can't not win that, I think. I think, they've got, I think they've got to win Friday night. Bournemouth won, West Ham United won at the Vitality Stadium. Um I think uh, from a West Ham point of view, I mean, the, from a, a lineup point of view, the only surprise was Ariola in for uh, for Fabianski. Alvarez obviously wasn't registered and ready in time for this game, but I think he'll he'll be ready for for the next game. You know, James Will Prowse official official this yeah. morning. JWP is through the door. Harry Maguire should be done this week. That they're saying he's negotiating his exit terms from Man. United. I don't know what that means. It's a payoff, mate. <laughs> exactly that, right? Because <laughs> they keep saying uh, wages are not going to be a problem. I'm like, well, that, that either means United are, are like paying off half his wages or something because we are not going to be paying that kind of money. Um, so the, the only surprise was obviously Ariola um, in for Fabi. Was a surprise for me. It wasn't for Chris Stone. Um, Bournemouth started with um, Kierkegaard's kick. Left back. I haven't seen a lot of the games. Kierkez. I'm going to leave this purely to you. But I'm I am going to watch the game for our talking he's the tactics one that this week. Ask about, is he any good? Because um, I think a lot of people are interested in him. But I think it is hard as a 19 year old to start in the Premier League, and it's hard to start in the Premier League regardless of how old you are. But when you're a teenager in such a quite a physical game as well, I did think it was it was a quite a difficult game for him to get into. But overall, uh, West Ham played well in the first half. Um, it was one of those where you know like how uh, the, the work rate was really good. Like the tackling, the tracking, the, the, the harrying, trying to get the ball back. It was like as if the, they'd kind of had a look and said, well, Declan Rice, what's he good at? Winning the ball back. We've all collectively got to take responsibility for doing all the running and tackling that he might have done. And yeah. everybody was a, a level above. Packeter certainly didn't down tools. No as way. in, oh, I want to go to City. All like, of them didn't. They, I was very happy with the work rate. And I think we, did, we had the better chances in the first half without particularly having any big chances. Bournemouth at set pieces. You talked about Burnley have got a set piece defending problem. Bournemouth have got a set piece defending problem. We didn't score, but hit the post and went close. Like Socek basically won every header from a corner in the first half um, and they weren't able to get close to him. So I think they've got a defensive problem, Bournemouth. Um, and then second half, obviously as, as we're one up, once Bowen uh, puts a worldie in, um, they had to increase the intensity and we do what West Ham do, which is sit back. And that goal was coming inevitably. Semenya, when he came on, was a bit lively um, and definitely added to their attacking threat from a Bournemouth point of view. 
and Moyes does what Moyes does, which is makes rubbish substitutions, which people aren't happy with, and we sit back. Do you know what? I, I saw a comment that someone said about West Ham, which summed it up. You know what we are? We're a count- we've set up now to be a counter-attacking team that just doesn't counter-attack. We sit that up, sounds a bit grim. We soak up the pressure, ready to hit on the break, and then as soon as we win the ball back, we just don't do the second half of it, right, which is okay. hit on the break. Um, but it wasn't bad from West Ham. Like, a lot of people are thinking, you know what, this is an issue. And it's a deflection that lets Solanke get in. Um, it was coming. I wouldn't go so far as to say it was undeserved, but that goal was, was coming um, because we were inviting so much pressure. But I do think, add Alvarez in there as a bit more solidity in front of the back four. Aguerd and Zuma played okay. They had good games. I think there's... there's um, there's a solid base there to build on. I do think West Ham are going to struggle to score goals, though. So that transition from defence into attack is is awful. Um, from a Bournemouth point of view, mate, 5.0, David Brooks. This is David nice to hear. Brooks. I saw his volley was great. David Brooks. Uh, he picked, it, he's taking shots. He's attacking. He's involved. Um, I really liked what I saw of him. If I was to pick a Bournemouth player right now, it wouldn't be Kerkes. It would be David Brooks at 5 million. I mean, their fixtures are, are rough. Yeah, I need to um, wait till it gets better, but he might be one that I look we, at when their fixtures I, get I better. I think, yeah, they're one to monitor. We uh, They kind of get good again, sort of game week eight-ish. When we spoke to Neil on Correspondent Week, we, we kind of was in agreement that probably one of these 5.0s at Bournemouth would emerge probably by the time that you wanted to, to look at it. And Neil will come on Clash of Correspondents prior to the game with Arsenal in game week seven as well. So by then, I'm hoping we've kind of got... A, clear indication because it could be Christie, it could be Cliver, it could be Anthony. There's a few in there all at that that similar value. But to be honest with, with David Brooks, it's just great to hear that he's looked back to yeah, David Brooks he, he, I like David ago. Brooks a lot. Um, when they first came up, I thought he was a good player. He was the one that I looked at from that and I thought, oh, <clears throat> make a note of because when, when the fixtures turn, he might be one that will now allow a little bit of uh, of enabler. Uh, can I come back to you on Kirkes? So, yeah. like, like good, bad? Because... What the guys want to know, he's playing against Salah this week, right? So Oh, he was fine. He was playing against Bowen. Like, how did week, he play right? against Bowen? Because it's kind of comparable. He was fine. But the thing is, I didn't f- follow his signing or know anything about him. So I didn't know. Well, like, what's, what's the hype about him? Has he got a lot of attacking threat? Yeah, yeah. Well, he didn't have. He, he bombed forward a little bit. But I don't think I would read too much into it more than it's a 19-year-old adapting to the Premier League. Like, he was tidy. He's got pace for sure. Um it wasn't. It was a fifty-fifty with Bowen. It wasn't like Bowen was tearing him to shreds at all. It was all right, but Bowen was cutting in quite a bit. Tidy, steady, oh, not tearing up trees. Um, wouldn't make me want to buy him, but also wouldn't make me scared to own him. But I don't think Bournemouth are going to keep a lot of clean sheets, mate. I think set pieces, they're not. They're, they're not strong. They're okay. not steady. So Kirkes for me would be if you're buying him for attacking returns. And then I might even go to Udogi or something like but, that. By the way, him. just just connecting the dots because there's two teams we've already said might have a problem here on set pieces: Burnley and Bournemouth. Tottenham play cons- play them consecutive games, which is three and four. Okay, Romero then or Madison for the delivery. <laughs> Madison, yeah. Madison for the delivery. I think both possibly. West Ham and, and Bournemouth will be happy to come away with it. A draw, shake hands, live to fight another day. There's learning from both sides. What, what's interesting, and, and one reason why I'm really keen to watch the game back as well is. A, a, our talking tactics this week have kind of labelled it as Bournemouth's left-hand side because we did think it was going to be a real bias. What we'd seen in pre-season suggested they'd have a bias on that side. The weekend suggests data that there isn't one at coming. No, there wasn't. No. If anything, it was Brooks on that side that was that yeah. was interesting. So, uh, Brighton four, Luton one. Brighton back to scoring goals and uh, yeah, other than the, the leaking the penalty for uh, uh, Luton, I thought it was a good performance for Brighton. <laughs> we were out Saturday afternoon. Um, I did watch this, the whole of this game back on Saturday night after Newcastle Villa. It, it was, was a penalty, wasn't it? It was Morris. rerun on Skype. Both of those are, shouldn't have been penalties. Yeah. Both both teams, both soft as hell. I don't think either of them were penalties. Um, but flicking on Twitter, the biggest thing going on on Saturday afternoon was how was this stupid and not returned yeah. uh, in this game? So but it other, means the decision to buy him was right. He obviously set up the goal for Ferguson at the end, but he'd, he'd set up two others, which uh, I, I think Pedro hit the post with, with one and maybe Gross the other hit the post. I can't remember hit the post, but he'd set up both of those chances at the post. Did the highest XA in the league at the weekend, 1.33. Okay, yes, it's a good fixture against Luton, but 
again, so do the Trent versus an Estupanan comparison. Like, isn't Estupanan everything that Trent originally was when Trent was five million? The thing is with Estupanan is he's such an athlete. The commentator, when I watched that game back, threw a stat out that he did 70 more sprints than any other player in the Premier League last year. Estupanan? Yeah. Okay. Well, he didn't even start in game week one either. He joined them like a few games out. So he's give a few teams, a, a few players, a couple of games yeah. at the start as well. He's a uh, dynamite. I told he? you after that Arsenal game, I'd have drug tested him. And what I watched at that game, I'd drug test him after that one as well. He is brilliant. He's, he's, do you know what? It'd be a really enjoyable player to to own and watch, I think, as, as well. He's just got absolute license to go and pop up in various different positions. So despite his ownership being is he big. from Ecuador, Colombia. Uh, yeah, he's uh, Casado and him are the same, aren't they? Ecuador, yeah. Ecuador, okay. yeah. Casado, well, we're I just made we, we sure assume he's going to Chelsea. James is not, a, he was just like Colombian, drug test him, you know, you're the national. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, there's, there's no link in that at all. It's just the guy the runs for days on end. <laughs> yeah. I want to know, let's say. His stats were off the charts. You know, you know, Hulk Hogan used to say, take your vitamins, right? I want to know what vitamins he's <laughs> taking. That's vitamins in this country, by the way. Oh, um, yeah, but he's he's brilliant. He's obviously going nowhere at the moment. And it's the link up with whoever's in front of him as well. Yes, so he obviously has a good relationship. Look, I mean, a Dingra come on and scored, right? And you were talking about him pre-, pre Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. he's, he's, he's the pro- next one. Rotation is a problem here for, for Brighton that will miss out a bit, I think. He came on and played on the right. Uh, which shouldn't surprise because Solly March was behind the others in terms of fitness. I actually thought it was questionable whether March would start, to tell you the truth. So Dingo came on, played on that side later in the game, obviously scored his goal, which, bless um, Mpanzu, is obviously the, the player who's come through all the leagues with Luton. What is he doing on that goal? Is disastrous. You can see his mates are about to give him grief. It's such a bad error, they don't buffer. <laughs> Terrible. But actually, as well, Ferguson obviously stretches on the fourth goal, if he doesn't get there, Dingra scores. Right. So, you know, these are the sort of ones you pick up in the eye test as well. If he gets regular minutes for Brian, I'm, I'm so interested again, in him five million. immediately. Five yeah. million again. This is, uh, we were talking about all the 6.5s. It's actually maybe five millions where there could be some bargains to be um, had. The Jao Pedro owners will obviously be very, very pleased with, with what they've got from the weekend. Highest XG in, in the league at the weekend, which obviously does, of course, in, include a penalty. We knew last week that he's on them. I think we, definitely know that he's on him now because obviously James Milner was was on the pitch as well so that didn't have a, an impact obviously Milner played right back uh, which meant Pascal Gross played further forward uh, in central midfield alongside the Hood got the nod ahead of Billy Gilmore Pedro it's just great value isn't it at 5-5 five, five at the moment someone playing up front for I mean arguably the best defensive team in the league in terms of data and underlying numbers they're astonishing defensive so no, offensive. Oh, offensive. I thought you said defensive. They're a, they're like, offensive. Offense. They're, they're, they're a joke offensively. Another name to keep an eye on is uh, Jan Paul Van Heck. Because he's 4.0. Obviously started at the weekend. So that's not over Adam Webster. Uh, Igor Julio, who they've brought in from Fiorentina, is more of a left-sided centre-back. So that would free Dunk to go back up to right-sided centre-back, which is probably favourable, let's say. Um, but one to keep an eye on as well. But it's stupid and it's worth the the one million more as it stands in any case. For Luton, um, not bad at all. Like they were in the game till the end. 4 1 was a, you know, Brighton were deserved to win. 4 1 felt a little bit harsh in the end, particularly with the manner of, of those two final goals. Yeah, but they were, they were in the game. Morris, we still think he's on penalties. I know he took it. There's still a little bit of debate about whether Adibayo would perhaps be the favoured penalty table. He was off the pitch at the time. Um, Morris will tick over nicely at 5.5, but. Like if you start if you started with Morris, you know, he scored this week and you're looking at Jao Pedro at the same price and Morris has got a blank this week. It's it's tough. The one that people I think would be most interested in is obviously Issa Kabore. Good underlying numbers, XA quite high at the weekend, around about zero point eight four, depending on where you look, but that's what I took from understat. So that's good. And he didn't play the full ninety either. Dotty came on for him. Dotty we'd we'd thought was in competition with Joel's on the left hand side. Giles puts one hell of a delivery and we said that with, with James Alcott on the ripple effect last week. His delivery is absolutely brilliant. Couldn't justify paying 0. 0.4, 0. 0.5 more for him than Kabori. But when that double does drop further on down the line, he'll be worth considering Giles because that delivery, he's definitely going to pop in with a few assists during the course of the season. Everton nil, Fulham 1. We'll talk about this game. 
You want to talk about it? Well, no, let's do it as a, a quick fire. We've still got quite a few games Mo- to get Morpe through. Morpe Leno, the, the final revenge. Morpe had the highest XG in the league without scoring this weekend. And uh, obviously that relates back to Not the... a single return across the Everton Mo- Morpe the Leno incident when they were both at Brighton Arsenal, respectively, the first weekend back after COVID, which I'd, I, had, I hadn't considered it till the next day. Oh, they, to be honest, Everton should have won this. It's, yeah, it's there's not no doubt different. about it. Uh, Everton so what do you won. take from it? Like, do you take okay? There's good underlying numbers there, and we should maybe still keep an eye on Everton. Or they fucked up because this is a home game, and they needed to win it to get some points on the board. And and these uh, winnable games come not round. That well, often. Leno's eleven point return. Twelve. So, uh, Twelve was it? Twelve. Mate. Hell, Twelve. Tells us what we need to know about the game. Yeah, I think to be totally honest, it's in great. The end, uh, maximum bonus. Yeah, of course. And, uh, Inevitable when he's when well. he's made that many saves. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, missed opportunity for Everson where, to be honest, I think if Calvert-Lewin had been fit and played, they would have won the game. Simple as that. They don't have... When you look at that midfield, I think that is fine. Garner, Gay, Onana, Iwobi, Decorey basically played behind Morpé. But none of them are going to chip in with enough. Like, Decorey, I think, if he's going to continue to play there, is kind of like a watch and wait when perhaps Everton have... I say when Everton have better run the fixtures, but they kind of have it now. But what means you're not going to buy before Villa away this week. That's one of the hardest they've got in the first eight, nine. So there are games for Everton to repair this, but if they don't do well in kind of the next six, seven, then they've got a horrible run that lasts about 22 game weeks afterwards. So they really have, they really have got to get some results over this kind of August, September period. For Fulham, repetitive theme, no Paulinia in trouble. Simple as that. He's massive for What's the for prognosis them. on him? We don't know. The prognosis on him this morning is that Liverpool might be going in, which is what I suggested Liverpool should do a couple of weeks uh, because ago. Because Chelsea's Casado And Lavia. And on. Looks like Chelsea are getting both. So Liverpool are back at square one. Uh, and it might be. Paulinho, probably age-wise, isn't the profile what they want to look at. But He'll do the job they need. Yeah, he's a really good player, Paulinho. Yeah. And it's just clear as day last year. Whenever he didn't play for Fulham, they had a problem. Obviously, Mitrovic didn't start either. So you've got those two to come back into, into the team. I think Fulham have got, obviously, Brentford, Arsenal, Man City in the next three. So the flip is as well. This was important for Fulham as well to kind of get out, get the result on the board and disappear, which eases the pressure off those next three. Of course, they're very capable of beating Brentford this weekend. They wouldn't expect anything from the next two. So that gives them a, a little buffer which is fine. If they have a good result this weekend as well, then irrespective of what happens in three and four, they've had a good start because of the fixtures they've got. But uh, yeah, I'd want to watch him brief on Fulham. I think it sounds like Mitrovic will stay now. Yeah. But I, if Paulinho does go, I'd become more concerned about it. He's more important for the team, not for fantasy, obviously. He's so important to that team, Paulinho. They'll struggle to replace him, I think, if he goes. Sheffield United nil, Crystal Palace won. I mean, two players in the Palace team with an XG uh, I of above one in uh, both Edouard that you mentioned, the highest at the weekend. Was Ed- Edouard the highest? Uh, he was highest for non-penalty, non-penalty. XG. Uh, and then obviously Eze was over one as well for goal involvement. Um, from what I heard at half-time when they were going around the grounds, Eze should have had a, like a hat-trick by half-time. He had quite, was firing off quite a lot of shots in terms of shot volume from Eze as well. Your volume though, but not... Quality, yeah, sure, but I think it comes over time. Like first game of the season, right? A little bit of rust, but it just goes to show his involvement is wanting to get shots off and be in and around positions where he can. He's, uh, he's get shots off. He's, he's been linked to my team quite a bit in the last twenty four hours. Oof. Yes, please. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's going to cost proper money though. That's the thing. We've now. got it now, haven't we? Sixty five, seventy. You, you do. That's also true. And that's probably the, the spot in the team that needs a bit more. Perhaps, yeah. You put him in there with Madison and Basuma sitting behind it. Let Ange cook, people. Um, no, I don't think that deal will go through because I just don't think Palace can afford to, to lose him as no. it stands. We've obviously no Elise and Zahar's gone. I'm, I'm sure Palace will do a little bit of business between now and the window opening. The only surprise in their lineup was Tyreek Mitchell played, which we didn't think he was going to be fit, but was obviously first choice at left back. They did line up with... Uh, a double pivot, as we'd have expected. The core raid to Liverpool links are probably going to come back around over the next couple of days as well, because he was linked a, a few weeks back. Um, but that's that's strong in there with with Lerma Decore protecting Eze, if you will. That's that's strong. But 
you can't help but look at the free ahead of it as well and go, I oh, don't see many returns in no Schlupp, Edward and IU. I think uh, a lot of the teams at the bottom, like your Sheffield United and, and Palaces and even West Ham and all, everyone from, let's say, 10th down that you we've talked about, goals is going to be the one. Mm. Uh, it's, it's goal scoring is going to be the challenge. Yeah. Uh, for Sheffield United, just briefly, that midfield... Basham, 4.0 defender playing in midfield. This, I promise you guys, this time, this is not trap. a trap. This is not a trap. This is not even a trap. You're just not going there. Yeah. This is not John Lundstrom uh, moment. Uh, Oliver Norwood and, and Ben Osborne made up the, the midfield three. That's that's going to change, right? So they've got Vinicius Souza coming in. I was really surprised that Anis Slimani didn't start. And they've also completed the sign of Gustavo Hamer from Coventry, who's quite a, a creative player as well. So... I think with all three promoted clubs, it almost feels like don't judge them till we the window shut and stuff. We know Sheffield United haven't got a lot of money to spend, but bodies incoming probably will happen. Um, I have, for the Bulldog owners, heard a rumour that he might have had a problem uh, after the game, a potential calf injury, which I don't think has been reported. And he probably will be for a few people who have gone down the two 4.0 routes, probably in combination with Kabori and Bayer, one or the other. If he's out as well, you've got no bench cover this week, which will be fine if your players play. But just keep an eye. I'm sure you'll get some news on Bulldog if that rumour is potentially true. But just keep an eye on ear out for that. He would be the 4.0 if you, if you, I don't know, if you're wild card in this week and he is fit. That's probably the one to go to at this moment, considering Bayer and... Um, Kabori don't have a fixture this weekend. If Sheffield United don't improve that squad, they will go down. They'll, they'll be and, and they'll be the worst team in they've the got some incomings, but, they, but, but they, they will do something. Yeah, yeah. This Finisher Souza that they've bought is really highly rated. Mm. A bit of a destroyer, from what I've heard. I'll have a look at him later this week. Cool. Well, let's see where that progresses. Um, next up, the uh, Geordies versus Aston Villa. I've got to give a shout out to one of my mates who's in the uh, a mini league. There's, there's just so three of us in it. He's a new, Newcastle fan. And Sunday morning, when I looked at the teams for the other two boys, I'd seen he put triple Newcastle in. And our Newcastle's fixtures are tough, right? So their ownership across their players is quite low. Yep. It's like, great. He's been blinded by his love of his football team and tripled up on Newcastle when they're not going to get that many points in. Then I looked at the midfield option. He'd picked Harvey Barnes. I was like, yeah, that Barnes that hasn't even started yet. <laughs> so he ends up with Isak Barnes and uh, Trippier. For a grand total of like 28, 29 points or something. Trips it's, didn't get anything, did he? Trips got two. Yeah. But Barnes, I think, was 13. and it's at 12 and 13 between the two of them, I think. Barnes, 11, off the bench. And it's at I think 13. If you went Trippier... 24, you, 25, 26 points from the three of them. If you went Trippier, you'd be gutted with that result, I think. For yeah. them to get nothing and they've scored five. Yeah. Um, and you're going to be looking at that with the likes of Chilwells, this two Penance, et cetera, if you're not there and thinking that's an easy way to find some money with what Newcastle have got coming next. I know there was a few that we even suggested playing him in game week one, bench him two, three, four and have him ready for five onwards. I'm sure those who've got Botman have probably got similar plans and ideas at the moment. We've had our first price rise of the week. Yes, in, Alex, uh, Alexander Isak. Isak. Yep. Guys, herd mentality. The first player to go up in price has got Manchester City away this week. It was, what is it Patrice Evra says? I don't know. I love this game. Oh, okay, is that <laughs> like this says? happens <laughs> every year. Yeah. And it, what, what are you going to do? This is exactly it. You know, go back to that kind of uh, working out your outcome. Oh my God, Isak went mental against Villa. Why didn't you have him mm. last week? If you thought it was to what he's now scored a couple against Villa and he's about to come into Man City, Liverpool, Brighton, and now you've decided you want to buy him. Listen, you have my free will to go and do that, but you should have started with him if, if you thought he was going to be that good. Um, so no I'm, no, I'm not tempted to go and chase after Isak, who don't be surprised because he's gone up early. If he's 7.7 .7 by the weekend, the people ain't going to care that he's got no. Man City away. It's just, ah, oh, he's top scoring forward in the game. That's all That's all people who are less engaged are going to be looking buy, at. He will he, get investment. If you're buying like an Isak, he's there to stay for a while, right? But what are you, where, where are you getting Isak from? So uh, obviously... Watkins, maybe. Possibly Watkins. <laughs> what, I was we're thinking, what we're going to do is I'm going to sell Jesus, Watkins maybe. has got Everton at home and I'm going to sell him to get Isak away to Man City. Like, there's, not, there's not that many strikers that are more expensive. So you, if you're coming down, or are people making two transfers to find some money to move up? Uh, Jackson, 
albeit didn't return yesterday, but he's at that seven million. Maybe people had half a million in the bank. So uh, here's here's one for you. Then have a quick look because there's an explanation for this. Where are people finding the money? Look at the most transferred out players this week. You'll see Christopher and Kunku. You'll see Gabriel Jesus. You'll see Harry Kane. <laughs> so don't out. worry about the people. Bruin, <laughs> Stones. Okay, Kane. Don't worry about the people who are buying his sack. <laughs> it's my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. But Newcastle will be so happy to start with a 5-1 victory at home against a highly tipped Aston Villa. Uh, yeah, look, Newcastle would smash it. really good. Um Great, great performance, great result. Again, they've got difficult games coming up. St. James is going to be such a rough away game for anybody this year. And Barnes and Wilson are obviously came on as subs, returned really well on top of Isak. Must shout out Isak's finish for his third, uh, the Newcastle's third goal. What's the third goal, I think? Because to be honest, it wasn't until the second time I saw it. I thought he'd kind of hit it into the ground or Conster had got a block and it had looped it over Martinez. What a finish that is. Gorgeous. I love him as a player, by the way, and I think he will be a very good asset during the course of this season. Um, yeah, good all round. I thought Tonali had a really good debut. Um, he's got a kind of a elegance about him. He, he looks like a top-level player. I think that's a really astute signing for Newcastle. It looks strong. Joel Linton compliments him and, and Grimera's really well. They've got more options now, which is going to be really important well, with Champions got loads League football. Of options, yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. Loads. So I still think, as we've said numerous times over the summer, he needs a bit more depth defensively. They've been linked with moves for Tierney and Cucurella this morning in terms of left back option. By the way, Newcastle, if you've got any money, just, just go and buy Rico Henry. You can have that advice for free. But I think a centre back's probably more important for them. Because like, like we've already discussed as well, now Livermento is with the club. You can shove Trippier to left back. It's not ideal, but that would be a solution for them if something happened to, say, burn and targets unavailable as well. I saw uh, our Villa correspondent, Lee Jackson, tweeted this morning. He said, uh, first Planet FPL game week review is out today. Can't wait. I don't know why you want to listen to this, Lee, because um, you're not going to like it. So... What we've seen a lot from Villa in pre-season was this real bias to attacking primarily on the right because Alex Moreno's been injured. It didn't really happen in this game. So played a flat 4-4-2 and understand why because it basically really worked against Newcastle when they played each other in April. But some of the components from that game obviously weren't available this time like Moreno, like Jacob Ramsey, like Emmy Buendia. And do you know what? They were in the game for quite a while. I think you know uh, Diaby looked really threatening in the first half, particularly, is going to really be one to keep an eye on. Ollie Watkins absolutely fine up front. They were competitive, but later in the game, the problem got magnified more and more. It's a very easy narrative, and people always do this, particularly with Liverpool. When Liverpool have a bad day, oh my God, I can't believe they played the high line. And that's what people are saying now about Villa. The high line has been very, very successful for Villa at the back end of last season. So I can certainly understand why it's in place. Um, the, the problem is, I think, I'm not saying that they've been found out, but if you think back when I went to Villa Park, game week 36, and I said to you, anybody with a little bit of brain is going to expose this at some point soon. And Newcastle's late running, from particularly, say, Harvey Barnes later in the game, and the timing of the pass, it was just so easy to play through them. Against Tottenham, it was like a high line, but they, Tottenham didn't have any runners because this very static in the way they were playing at the time. Newcastle had people running through and beyond, and all he literally had to do was time the, time the ball into space. And even the ones that they did do well from Newcastle had so many more opportunities just to roll through. So I think um, I stress concerns about Villa's high line towards the end of the season, and I think with Mings out now, that's going to need a relook. It's massively going to need a relook because you underestimate massively the importance of these leadership and organisational qualities, because obviously, unfortunately, he's picked up what looked like a very serious injury in the first half as well. And I don't think, in fairness, if he'd have stayed fit, I don't think the game would have ended up as shambolic. To be honest, it was shambolic from Villa in the last 20 minutes or so. And I understand they're chasing the game, etc. But they didn't look to me in that period like they, they could put any sort of, you know, people tip them up for outside of the top four. And I realise it's Newcastle away. And my team knows how to get a batter in there, by the way. But, yeah, off. I think it, it feels like with the Mings and Buendia injuries, very suddenly this looks like it's becoming a more difficult season for, for Villa. Well, look, they're going to Everton now. 
Home. Oh yeah, it's so, fine. And like, go and buy yeah, and Watkins own, and Diaby. And hold your, hold absolutely your, fine. Hold your nerve with those guys I'd, for sure. I'd be concerned about um, some of the defensive stuff. For the, and I can't believe the Pau Torres didn't play. Mm. Everything that we had in preseason suggested he'll play left back. Cash will go up the right hand side. Why, like Luca Dean was suddenly in the team. I'm, I'm not sure. Like I said, I think they was looking for a little bit more balance in what they wanted to do with their two fullbacks during the game. It didn't work. I think they'll go back to that and probably have the one that sided by us. But now, it probably needs Carlos to play regularly. And the insiders have said to me as well, he's going to really struggle with his high line and stuff. So I don't know if Villa alternate tactics in the next few weeks. I mean this seriously. Someone like Decore with his late running, if the pass is right, I wouldn't be surprised if he scored at the weekend. He had that chance against Fulham at the weekend. He's looking at that. What sort of teams are playing Villa and saying, have you got runners? Now, you could probably look at, say, Everton and Burnley and say, mm, maybe not so much. I think it's someone like Gakpo for Liverpool in game week four, like that kind of late following up the play and then running in behind. Yeah, Salah could have a field day against him in game week four, nice. in fairness. Let's talk about Brentford 2, Spurs 2 yesterday. Um, I caught from when uh, Mboma got his uh, penalty. Uh, all the way through to uh, the equaliser and, and the first half and the end, and the start of the second half. Sorry, the first half of the second half as well. It felt very much like, to be honest, when Brentford um, were at, attack, you had more of the possession. But when Brentford went for it, like they could they could get in behind Emerson and they were so direct with Visser and Yanel and Mbomo and stuff that every time they attacked, they were like they're going to get a shot off or a chance here. Um, your build up play was was much better. I did think Basuma was good. Um, was great. But he will have he will be suspended at least four games or five games throughout the course of this entire season. Um unless the and to be fair, it's a point for all players, unless they get used to these little yellow cards, because there was a few in our game as well that would definitely not have been given last year. Yeah, Madison. Madison was mouthing, yeah. was he like I asked him a question. But even That's even Bowen, said. right? There was a there was a fifty fifty tackle that two players went in, the ball broke free and Bowen ran off with the ball. But then the ref paused it and held back. He gave Bowen a yellow card for kicking the ball away. He was like, but you hadn't blown for the foul. So what am I going to do? Wait, like just stand still until you blow for the foul. You've got to play to the whistle. So playing means running with the ball. And he got a yellow card for it. I thought that was a bit mad. Players will need to adjust. Mm. Um, but I did think uh, anybody that went with Mboma, we knew it was a decent pick because he is talismanic there for, for Brentford without Tony there. So... Definitely still eyes on uh, on Mbomo, Henry. Like they're they're just a well oiled machine. Brentford, they just know what they're doing and they're yeah, so good. I, I, I did laugh at the end of the first half. I was like, which team like he keeps the ball in play for the least amount of time? Them. Eleven minutes out of the I was like, how you know uh, what it feels like? I'm not surprised that it's at Brentford that that ridiculous number comes up. Um, but even Spurs played well. You, you attacking wise, Kulu cutting in from the left, trying to get creative and make things happen. Um, I think my biggest takeaway was that uh, if I had two, if I had 7.5 million in midfield to spend, I'd buy Madison over a Charleston. I'm not sure. I think it's easy to look at yesterday and the two assists and go, yes, that's the answer. But I think it's more, Madison has a more all-round game where I think he will provide assists. If he if he doesn't score, he'll chip in here and there with bits and pieces of assists. I feel like when we get to the end of the season, it might be a very similar amount of points, but I feel like Madison will chip away all season, whereas Richarlison will have a few games where he might get a couple of goals, but then also go through three games of just like 2-2-1. Two, two, yeah, I hear that. Um, I wouldn't have a preference between the two right now. To probably buy Richarlison personally at, at cheaper. He's clearly the same price. He's going to seven he's, and a half. Both of them. He's going to play through Where's the middle. Richarlison's seven. Richarlison's seven. Oh, I thought it's, they were both he's, seven. He's going to play half, through the middle. Place. That's clear. Um, and I think what's important to say is as well, these other teams and other positions at the moment you look at and you go, oh yeah, but they are going to buy there. I'm pretty sure Tottenham are not going to buy another forward to replace Harry Kane. They're going to strengthen other areas of the team. And give him the chance. Not Romelu? I heard Lukaku, mate. Oh, yeah. I heard Lukaku's name mentioned. Listen, stop being lazy. But He's on like 300 grand a week. Tottenham aren't going near that. Uh, yeah, you never know. But, so, I mean, say he was to pop up, no, for example, I, that I, would change no, things No, I a do lot. know Tottenham are not going to go for Romelu Lukaku. Romelu Lukaku, near the, Romelu Lukaku near the end of the window will end up in Saudi Arabia because no one else can afford his wages. I'm fairly sure that's what will happen. Or back at Chelsea. Oh, look at Mbappe. 
Are you suggesting Lukaku, up Lukaku, all of his toys. Lukaku might do the Winston Bogard on... He picked up all his toys, got back in his pram, did Mbappe, and he's back to training, and he's going to sign a new contract. Did, did you know he's a subject to money in football this week, Serge? Who? Mbappe. Is he? Yeah, mate. Okay. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be podding on that later in the week on Patreon. Um, look, it's a fair result. I think yeah. what I said to Clayton and Nico this morning is that I, Brentford are, for me, the best kind of pound-for-pound pound organisational side in the league. Present challenges, right? So they're very well oiled. They know to play this, this back five in the more kind of difficult fixtures. And I think they'll go back to a back four in the next three, which is important. So for those who've gone in Bumo, yep, sure. Played through the middle at the weekend. They're probably back on the right, I imagine going to Fulham and the two fixtures they got after that, which is he's still returning those fixtures quite highly likely. It's not a problem. He's definitely on pens. He'll be involved. He actually should have returned more than what he actually got in the game yesterday. So, yeah, Brentford deserved at least a point because exactly what you said, they were very threatening on the counter. The first half was chaotic in terms of most of the chances. And it's also real credit to the two teams as well because there were long stoppages for VAR incidents, the Romero concussion. I actually thought that was a penalty, by the way. Yeah. When when Romero and Numbumo clash heads, I've not seen anyone say it. Romero heads him in the back of the head. If he kicked him in the back of the calf, he gets a penalty, innit? Yeah. Probably. I think Brentford could have had three penalties in the game. Because I also think the, the Shade one on Vicario near the end, I think it was a pen as well. Um, particularly impressive for Brentford, I think the way they kind of were resilient in the second half with no Ben Mee as well was obviously a miss for them. As I said, I think they'll go back to a back four from what they played. Yesterday, Ajer would probably come out. Tom Med said that if it was back four, it would probably be Pinnock and me. Obviously, if me's unavailable, then I'm sure Collins will stay in the team. And Bumo's going to be very, very consistent. Those who are on will be absolutely delighted. He's got another kind of good sort of six or seven fixtures. So I, I, that's a definite hold for me at the moment. And on what I saw yesterday, he's the standout one offensively. Uh, for Tottenham... Um, on Richarlison, I would say as well, Suji, is I'm really keen to do this. I was discussing this with my dad yesterday. I'm going to give him kind of 10, 12 games and not be critical of him. What you're going to get, by the way, with Richarlison is a narrative on touches, similar to the kind of narrative we have with Haaland about, oh, he doesn't touch the ball enough. That's a real kind of structure thing of, of Tottenham where if you're going to be the number nine, you are going to, and you're not Harry Kane, you are going to stay in that position and be asked to do that rather than link up a lot. It does mean, I think, that he'll have long spells in the game where he doesn't have many touches and he's not involved in the game so much. His role is going to be in and around the box, finish chances. And we'd have to say, actually, despite the fact my team played very well yesterday, I thought, and I think hopefully people enjoyed it and could see what they're trying to do, we didn't create that much. We have to be fair and say that. We dominated a lot of the game, but didn't, deserve, didn't do enough to deserve to win it, I think would be a fair reflection. We never really opened them up. And again, I think, consider what I said. Brentford, good side defensively, pound for pound, well organised. Some of these games coming up, we've said, is there burnley Bournemouth set-piece problems? It's Sheffield United at home in five. I'd look at that little run and think, yeah, if Richie, Richie could go off in that period. I can't stand him, to tell you the truth. No. But I want to give him 10, 12 games. He needs that run to show if he can do it or not. Not judge him on two, three games. Judge him you know, on kind of yeah. 10, 12, a long period where it's sustained. And let's, let's get to November or so and then start asking questions. Is he going to be good enough or he isn't? I suspect he's probably not, by the way. Doesn't mean he can't be a good FPL asset when we've got good fixtures. I'm very concerned about the goalkeeper, Serge. Mm. From what I've seen so far on Vicario, I don't think he's good enough. Um Destiny, I hope you enjoyed watching yesterday. Left back, really good. Emerson Royal, obviously, they were both inverting. Royal's pass numbers, we'll talk about that on Sky, I think. Bissouma, as said, was, was outstanding. Madison's going to chip in. Sonny, really quiet. Really, really quiet. I don't think he's an option for FPL at that price at the moment. It, would, it, it, would, be, it would be more a Madison or a, or a Richarlison conversation for me at cheaper. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that yesterday. I'm quite pleased with the with the performance, and it was a fair result. And last but not least, obviously the the big game of the weekend was uh, Chelsea Stamford Bridge against Liverpool. Um, it it we didn't know what way it was going to go, mainly because we don't know what Pochettino was going to be able to pull out of the bag with Chelsea in the short time that he'd been working with, and we know he's a capable coach. So if he'd had a chance to drill them and get them playing in a, in a certain way, it could have been. A real 50-50, but on the last six months or so, you'd say Liverpool should win. They go one up, then the disallowed goal, and you're thinking, right, if they're two up... That was game. 
done. But then that got disallowed. And then Chelsea won one. And then 2 1 Chelsea. And you're thinking, well, swing. And then it just kind of was flat throughout. So it ended up. Yeah, Chelsea got better the longer it went on. I think it's a fair result. And I think um, Chelsea gave more than I thought they would. They, they were much more in it than I thought they would be. Um, lots of positives. For, I mean, positives for both teams, but I think particularly for, for Chelsea. I think Chelsea fans would probably be quite interested by what Pochettino came up with yesterday. So I think it was a surprise to everybody that we got a back three from Chelsea, although Pochettino still claiming it a back four, um, which I think basically was because Colwell was really pulling out defensively to go against Salah when they were without the ball. That was the theory on that. But I think really offensively, it was a back three with James and Chilwell as wing-backs, which the FPL heads will obviously want. Whether that sticks for the forthcoming games, say against West Ham, I'm probably doubtful, to be totally honest. I think it probably will go back to a back four. And you should be conscious of that. I think that we should also factor in that most of us thought Chilwell would be a great asset from left-back. I wouldn't be concerned that it goes, he moves from left wing-back to left-back it makes him worse. I don't think it does because he's going to have easier fixtures coming up and stuff, right? And it's definitely a lopsided that he's going further forward than James at the moment. I mean, it's clear for me at the moment, Chilwell over James. Um, But yeah, they went with a a back three primarily, which we didn't expect because we saw zero of it from Chelsea in pre-season. I mean, it took a a good while for Liverpool to adapt. Gallagher played a, a deeper position which freed up Fernandes, who was good. I like the look of Jackson through the middle. He's right on radar for me for, for game week three as well because for me with the million in the bank, if I put Turner in this week, I've got 1.5 potentially to go Pedro to Jackson should I want to in game week three. is a potential option and I certainly wouldn't be booking that transfer in now. I want to see more, which we'll get the chance to do because the game against West Ham's on the telly on Sunday as well. Um, I think that they... They're probably not going to score bags of goals, Chelsea, which also adds to the appeal of someone like like Chilwell, I think. Yeah. Um, Jackson on radar, Colwell on radar, now that this first game's gone, I think, because he's cheap. Just be a little bit concerned because... This, uh, how do you pronounce his name, Serge? Uh, Disassi, who scored. Yeah. Axel, call him. Uh, Ag- Axel's yeah. good, yeah. Everyone under the age of 30 is like, what the fuck are you not talking about? You're going to make me call this Pod Beverly Hills Calf, aren't you? No. Yeah, maybe. Um, we didn't expect him to play, and he was good, by the way. I was really yeah. impressed with him. So goal. that puts a little bit of question mark in terms of back four. Does Cole will definitely play? But I think for um, natural left-footedness and the fact Badia Shaw will come back and compete, yes, I think Cole will probably will stay in the team at the moment. But I, I would probably expect Chelsea to go back to back four against West Ham would, would probably be my take. Is that how you'd see it, Serge? Yeah. Yeah, they won't they won't fear us uh going forward. Quite rightly, I should say as well. Liverpool the concerns remain for the same reasons. Um I I if they don't fix it, they're not changing for this title. They're as simple as that for me in terms of in front of the back four is putting too much duress on them. I don't think they played badly yesterday, but I thought it was possibly a little bit disappointing. I, I felt that I really felt with Sabosla and McAllister in the team to look far more energetic. I thought it was struggling a bit with the legs as the game went on. Klopp was right to make the substitutions that he did, by the way. But I, I, I just think that they still look quite easy to play through at times in the game. I was expecting a, a little bit more in terms of intensity and energy. and I, I felt in quite big spells of the game, it felt like it was, it was lacking. And I think Liverpool did do what I, I, I said to you on Friday's pod that might happen is they'd go, yeah, yeah, we don't want to get a PEL. And they could have won it with that, the, the Nunes effort and stuff themselves. Probably fair result. I think it was more positives here for Chelsea than Liverpool. In terms of Liverpool assets, you obviously, whatever you've got, you're not coming off this week. Um, if you want to force Mo Salah in and captain him, like, like be my guest. It's certainly a week where you can be competitive against Haaland. My take at the moment, my feelings on Haaland and captaincy is that it's a home game. There's no reason for me to need to go against it. I did say pre-season that I thought those who went with Salah should probably do it because how many opportunities is, is there going to be? And if you're looking at Liverpool, I'm the Bournemouth fan, I'm not captain Mo Salah, then you're almost asking yourself what he's doing there when you've got so many at the Madison to Saka value or even to Rashford value who who will show up and and do well. I'm not going to go against Haaland when he's got a home fixture or if he's playing against a team who I think could be in under threat of going down. And uh, that 
is probably me for the next seven weeks and I am to worry about this. Or the next six, I should say. Your take, Suj? Are you going to captain Trent this week? No. No? No. Um, because when uh, when Bournemouth made a couple of attacking substitutions with Kiefer Moore and Semen- Semenya coming on and they kept Solanke on the pitch, they were a threat. They really were a threat. They're strong, physically capable, direct. They'll get in behind. I think Bournemouth will score this weekend. Okay. Uh, if you had yeah, there's if, a very good chance Bournemouth will score. I think Liverpool will win, but if they if they if they up the intensity and they want to, Bournemouth have got goals in them. I do if, think. If you had Salah, would you captain this week? Yes, he was involved enough yesterday. Yes. However, yes. can I? Shall, can there's I, a massive however. Go on, you know, go on. You say what you, you go think. against Holland, you 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 take your life. Well, I, hands, I, I was so. I was going to say something a little bit naughty and say he might be punished for his reaction when he got substituted, and nah, perhaps therefore won't ain't even gonna start. Happen. Ain't going to happen. <laughs> ain't going to happen. If I was a football manager and my players were coming off like that, I'd be happy. Um, I think if if I had my, I'd probably go for it this week. Um, I think at the moment, for me, on the others, like the Jotters and the Gakpos and stuff, I just think it's too complicated. And I think it wouldn't surprise me if, say, Nunes does start this weekend. Um, it, it would surprise me more. I, I was still really of the opinion, and every Liverpool fan I spoke to disagreed, I really thought we'd play yesterday. Um, and I think Liverpool are better for having him in the team, to be totally honest. I think his chaos causes more space for others as well. And I'd like to see him get in that team. But yeah, at the moment, to be honest with you, like I'm looking at this week, I'm going to no Liverpool and I'm very calm about that. I'm not bothered. And that was my decision prior to the team I picked. Don't see me going to them. The only, the only, I, Even if I had an injury, like a Rashford got injured or something, I think I'd let him somewhere else further ahead, I think. So I'd just, just ignore it, I think. Cool. Uh, that's a wrap of the games. We've obviously got Manchester United Wolves uh, to go tonight and we'll cover it off in one of the pods this week. Uh, James is live streaming tomorrow, right? In the Ask James stream. So yeah, we're going to we're gonna flip it this week because I can't be doing three streams on Friday. Do you want to tell everybody how we're flipping it, what the schedule is for the rest of the week? Um, I've had a look at some of the questions in on Twitter um, or x.com or whatever it is and I'm going to pick one. Is that it? Did anyone ask about Gabriel? Can I just start? Did anyone ask? Because I specifically no. said don't ask about Gabriel. We didn't really talk about it. Talk about what? He's Gabriel. Better. But and then now. But what do you do? Well, Timber's obviously injured. My take is the, 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 the rumor potentially, and it's just a rumor, I must stress that. The rumor was that he might have been late for a team meeting or something, and there was a little bit of punishment. And we saw that with Aubameyang before the North London derby during the COVID season and stuff. Um, I would, if I was a Gabriel owner, I'd be keeping, would be my take right now. That's generally, I've, do you I feel agree. the same? I think he'll, slip, I think he'll uh, slot back in. I've, I think he'll go back in. Agreed. Yeah. But best with the injury in mind. So what have we got this week then? Uh, yeah, uh, Ask James stream tomorrow, 12 o'clock-ish. Yeah, we're just 12 o'clock on YouTube. Join in, audio afterwards. Sky Fantasy Football on Wednesday. Thursday, Clash of Correspondence returns. Crystal Palace versus Arsenal. So even more Arsenal take with Adam on Thursday. It will get his opinion uh, with Rory McLaughlin Dowd and Adam Pritchard. Uh, Friday will be People's Poll Podcast. We'll put out a vote probably on Wednesday for that. Patreon pods this week, Q&A today. Tomorrow is the Transfer Window Show with me and Clayton. Wednesday is Tottenham. Thursday is uh, Money in Football on Kylian Mbappe. Friday will be the Differential Show, our Game Week 2 preview podcast. If you want to support the show, it's www.patreon.com forward slash Planet FPL. Uh, the advanced tier content this week includes a look at a Game Week 2 wildcard and talking tactics, looking at that Bournemouth left side ahead of that important Liverpool-Bournemouth clash on the weekend. Sound. Um, a lot of the questions that we've had in on Twitter, we have answered, James. There's also quite a lot of, um, I don't know what the phrase you would use is, navel gazing, just kind of reflecting on their own transfers and selections. Things like, you know, is Jao Pedro still a good pick or should I be worried about Foden? I'm kind of putting all of that to one side because you can't make these kind of judgments off one game week. Jao Pedro's won, I, th- I think, like, again, Arsh, so he, well, he scored once at the weekend, right? Yeah. So he's playing Luton at home. Have you suddenly looked at that and gone, ah, oh, I wish you'd gone there. You should start with him. Well, vice versa, like, Foden didn't return. Also, but- we might get a very different Wolves tonight, which throws into different thinking, perhaps, for that game at the weekend. So, no, that that's one for me. I, I can't really bear that. 
the idea of, oh, I've let Luton at home go and now I'm going to buy someone. That's why I started with Free Brighton, mate. Yeah. Uh, so we'll give the last question of the show to uh, FPL underscore ARO7. I don't know if he's uh, piggybacking on CRO7, mate. And, uh, the Boo. But would you rather play darts or snooker? Snooker. Really? Yeah, I mean, I fancy myself with a Q. I used to be very good with snooker. Um, but what happened was, like, <laughs> this is a story that some patrons will have heard, but I had my eyes, eye operation done in Russia, like, 20 years ago, right? Um, so my ability to distance judge, like, short sight, long sight, is not as good as it used to be. So when I was little, we used to go to Whetstone Snooker Club down here. Um, so from the age of, like, 13, 14 to 18, go snooker club all the time. But the reason we used to go to snooker club was because when you pay your four pound an hour for the lights for the snooker table, he'd also serve you beer when you were underage. So rather than going to the pub, we knew snooker club was where we could get served underage. And also, cops ain't going to the snooker club to find underage drinkers. Really, <laughs> really? I'd tell you what. I used to go to Fourth Street and Tottenham High Road, and the cops were regularly in there. In the snooker club. <laughs> yeah. Oh mate, where's those snooker club? We never. I never saw any anything dodgy there with the cops. Um, but so once since my eyes have gotten a bit pony it's a bit harder to play uh, and judge distances and angles when when you get down and queue up so i'd say darts now but i've never played darts with any um consistency but i feel like it's uh, all about getting rhythm in your uh, throwing hand right with darts <laughs> i don't know stop laughing <laughs> ah. um you play darts yeah, i don't mind a bit of arrows like, yeah have you played though like consistently like playing every week Oh, no, 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 uh, no. Like no, that. So no. I don't know what, what my darts game would be like if I played consistently because that's all about muscle memory. So, uh, But we're going darts again for our Christmas party. We did that last year. We'll do it again this year. Oh, is it really? Yeah, yeah. Um, a bit of flight club. We should do that as a, a patron social, which leads me on to patreon.com forward slash planet FPL. Probably. Ah, yes. We do have a planned event on Saturday, August 26th. Yes. Uh, uh, details are on Patreon about so some football more, and a card game, maybe. Yes. Uh, snap. So if you uh, head over to patreon.com forward slash planet FPL, you'll learn all about how you can support the show. Uh, there's loads of tiers where you get additional podcasts, access to mini leagues, Slack, where we've got uh, James's fixture planning spreadsheet available to you, video content for the advanced tiers, meetups, merch coming soon one day, uh, and a whole bunch you more. Get on with it with a merch, with, man. That's Clayton's job. Uh, so if you want to support the show and you like what you hear, then head over to patreon.com forward slash planet FPL. We'd love to have you as part of the community. Um, the content James has announced, the games we've reviewed, plenty to go through this week before game week two. Anything else to add? No, Hope that's you enjoy it. the show. Nice to be back in a groove. Stay safe. Ciao for now. Thanks, everyone. Be nice to each other. Play it your way. Cue music, please, man child. Fest was busy, yo. Fest was busy. I thought he was recording this. Though. That's fine. The number of people, uh, I was surprised with uh, how many people were there. But what? it was a bit weird because um, it's in these arches and then it's like a warehouse that they just Yeah, I've been there. I've been right? there. So... The first bar I went in, I got a drink, and then you had to go all the way through, and there's like then where all the other shit was going on. I never went through. I went through once, literally, for like three minutes. Someone said it's really hot in there, and they're recording black box, but they're like 50 people gathered around a table like this. It's nonsensical. You're not watching a live show. So I didn't bother, and then we were all just standing outside um, drinking in in that tunnel and people doing team changes, and then... As soon as it got to quarter two, half seven, quarter to eight, because the game was at eight, right? They weren't showing the game, right? I'd say everybody that was part of Fest... <laughs> Clayton told me everyone left. So that's Nima and all that, Benny, Blanco, Lee Jackson, me, Sham, Claire, like everybody that you would know as part of our crew, we all went to the Thirsty Bear. So I was like, Clayton, we paid for this ticket. We, I've been inside to get a beer once, and once, that's it. I did one little loop and said hello to a couple of people. I saw Lee, uh, family, and a couple of people said hello, shook a few hands. Went for a piss. Gianni said, well, there's urinals over there, or there's toilets at the back. I said, I'll use the urinal so long as I can take a shit in the urinal. He said, that was fine. So <laughs> I didn't really. And then left. So I probably spent, inside the actual building where Fest was, I probably spent 20 minutes. I spent the rest of the time in the alley. You should have took the free ticket, didn't you? <laughs> you spent <laughs> no. the rest of the time in the alley. Yeah, and then at the Thirsty Bear. That was it. 
Because everybody was outside. It's literally that you can't use any of this. It's all boring. Well, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I don't really know what happened. Because after the game, I don't even know if the game finished at 10 10 30, They all went back to fest or not. Well, what I think Clace say? went back, yeah. Or whether they stayed at the Thursday bed. It, it would have been, um, been partial bedtime, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, I left at night. <laughs> at half time, I was like, this is going one of two Peace. ways. This is either 